could feel beauty rising. Hi, my name is Suze Gasky with Vermont Volunteer Services for Animals Humane Society, and welcome to our show for the animals. Today we have a special guest, Gina Brown, who is the owner of Spring Hill Horse Rescue, located in Clarendon, Vermont. Um, and Spring Hill has rescued, rehabilitated, and rehomed hundreds of animals and horses predominantly um, in need in Vermont. So welcome, Gina. Thank you, Sue. It's great to be here. And thanks for coming all the way over here, too. Oh, no problem. The other end of the world. Right. Um, I was on your website, and the mission statement says, Spring Hill's mission is to protect Vermont's equine through education, prevention, advocacy, and rescue rehabilitation and rehoming and I know that you're routinely called to evaluate cases of suspected abuse and neglect um, how long have you been in operation and what programs and services do you offer well we started Spring Hill Horse Rescue as a pilot program in January of 2000 to see if there was a need huh. um, quickly discovered that there was a need are you about the only rescue horse rescue um, we, we are the only rescue that I know of that are really geared toward animal cruelty mm -hmm. um, cases and working with law enforcement um, and such as that, but um, I can't quite tell you if there are others. Other horse rescues have come and gone since right. our inception, for sure. But um, I know different horse people. We've had um, Leslie Chatwell on but I don't think Leslie takes in rescue, but she does a great job. Um, I, think, I think you're probably the only one, you're the go-to person for horses. Well, we certainly, um, we are statewide, so we do work with you know, law enforcement throughout the state. We work with um, other animal shelters um, throughout the state if they, they get a call about um, large animals. Um, we do help and support you know, anywhere we can. So what sort of programs do you do? Well, our main program is rescue, rehabilitation, and rehoming of horses and other animals. Um, of course, if there were other animals in need, we wouldn't leave them behind. We've taken in cows, pigs, goats, um, chickens. We have oh. turkeys at the farm. Um, so, uh, what we like to do is we take them in, uh, we re rehabilitate them through diet, medical needs, um, hoof care. We evaluate them as far as their dispositions and um, riding abilities. And then we rehome them um, through adoption. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like the dating game. We try to match them up with the, the right owner to make sure it's door a good one, fit. Door number two. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we have a process for that. So how do you find qualified homes? If that's got to be awfully hard, especially in today's economy. It is rough. Um, but we do. We've been very fortunate. Um, not only do we not want the horse to fail at its new home, but we don't want the, the people either. And we don't want the people certainly to have a... A horse in their home that's not going to fit their family needs and then be like oh we got this horse right. and then the horse comes back mm -hmm. which we will always take our horses back um, that's one and that's so important very important yeah so when we try to with VVSA we're not a shelter but we try to put people in touch with other animals but the, we say to everybody the most important thing is that the animal is happy in its new home and if not we want the animal back you know, right. That's, that's a given. Right. That's our policy as well. Do you get very many back? Um, we do. We have, you know, gotten some back. And it's usually not because of the a problem with the animal. It's usually because people's lives have changed. Either mm -hmm. someone's lost a job or someone's gotten divorced or someone needs to move. Um, those kind of hardships. And horses live a long time. They do. They do. Horses can live into their 30s. Wow. Um, and ponies even longer. Yes. I had a friend, um, my friend Lawrence, when he passed, I inherited his animals, and the ponies were in their late 30s. And the vet came in and said, I want 100 pounds on this one, and I want 100 pounds off this one. <laughs> and I really didn't know horses or ponies, so yeah. it was a learning you know, curve. But I can't imagine that you find a lot of people 
that want older animals? Um, some people, especially those just starting out in the horse world, think that it's it's nice to get a young horse so it can grow with a family when in all actuality it's better for beginners to get older horses mm -hmm. I mean they're really worth their weight in gold because yeah. they've been through so much they're used to so many things um, and they can really really teach a beginner um, and have more patience mm -hmm. with people than younger horses because you know you got a young horse there's an old saying that says green on green makes black and blue <laughs> so I like that. Right. So when you have a green horse and you have a green rider, that can set both people and horse up to fail. Yeah. My so. sister's in Connecticut and she rescued a horse about a year ago. The poor thing was part of a 4-H and Margaret has put an awful lot of time and energy into the horse and it's a process. But the horse does not like her husband and <laughs> will attack anytime poor Jeff goes too close and so it's you know it's a younger horse too so mm. just what you're saying you know it's it's a process yeah. well it is a process and those behaviors are usually man-made like horses normally aren't right. aggressive like that they're I prey know. animals and they're very flight oriented so um, a lot of times that can get horses in trouble yeah where you know they can't be safe around people um, for one reason or another. That's why it's important, and I've you know I've already said it a few times, to set them up to succeed and mm -hmm. not to fail. Yeah. Um, Especially yeah. some of them where they come from backgrounds of cruelty. So we were talking earlier. Let's talk about animal cruelty. Um, oftentimes people are afraid to make a complaint. I know this with any animal because they're neighbors, and there's there can be retaliation. Um, if cruelty or neglect is suspected, what would somebody do? Well, there are a few things that you can do. Um, I would first and foremost say is to go online. There is a website called reportanimalcruelty.com mm -hmm. that you can go and file a complaint, and you can do it anonymously. Mm -hmm. um, if it's something urgent, I would call your local law enforcement right away. Um, you can call your local animal shelter or humane society and um, ask them what you should do. Some of them do take complaints and investigate them and others don't but can refer you. Um, you can always call us mm -hmm. or go to our website, um, send us an email. Um, we'll make sure we get your contact up throughout the show. Yeah, and you know, when we go out on a complaint, um, we never give the information of who called because mm -hmm. I just don't feel that's important right. at all. Because if there's no problem, then there's no problem. You know, right. It shouldn't matter. Um, and I've encouraged people that have called us that are afraid, send an email, send me a word doc without any you know, connection on. If it has to be investigated, that's what our job is. And right. then if it's legitimate, it's legitimate. If not, then I'll remember that for the next time. <laughs> But a lot of times, two people will look at something and think that it might be uh, a situation that needs to be investigated, but it might not be. Right. So, but right. I'm not a horse expert, you know. Well, no, you're right. Call. I would guesstimate probably a good 60 to 75 percent of the calls we get um, are calls that really aren't animal mm -hmm. cruelty. But it's, you know, people with good intentions. Ex and um, I'd rather have them do that. Exactly. Yeah. But in the winter time, especially, uh, we'll get phone calls saying, oh my gosh, I just went by these horses and they had a foot of snow on their backs and they're outside and uh, it's just horrible. And I'll say, well, is there a shelter there? And they'll say, oh yeah, they, and they won't go inside and no one's put them inside. Mm -hmm. But they're horses. Horses are outdoor animals. Um, they prefer to be outside. Mm -hmm. And just like your roof, if you have a foot of snow on your roof, that means you have good insulation, right? right? If it's melting, right. that means you don't. Or the long icicles, you've got a problem there. Exactly. Yeah. So you've got to kind of remember that, you know, a lot of what people do is for their own comfort. Mm -hmm. um, horses are very, very um, sturdy animals. I mean, they can tolerate a lot and they prefer to behave like horses, which mm -hmm. is outside. Um, and it, of course, it's always great, you know, they should have access mm -hmm. to shelter. 
either from the the sun, the extreme sun, or you know they don't really like cold uh, wind and rain. So right. a lot of times they will go in there. But we get a lot of calls about that that people think that they should be inside if it's. Well, we just had, um, I just attended the class that was put on last week, and I understand you're going to be putting one on, too, at your facility with horse investigation. And something that I had never heard of was rain rot on a horse. And mm -hmm. they, they had an example of this poor horse's back with an open sore. Yeah. Tell me, just in like a 10 second, what's rain rot? Rain rot is kind of a, a fungal infection. Um, the horses, they tend to get it more in the fall or sometimes in the spring, um, which is easily curable with like an antifungal bath. Mm -hmm. um, if it's really live, then you might have to treat it with antibiotics. But um, And some horses are more susceptible than others. I mean, you can have 10 horses in the same situation, in the same weather, in the same climate, and only one of them will get rain rot. Mm -hmm. um, it's just like people, they have you know, different reactions to different things. Um, you know, I don't think rain rot is cruelty. Untreated rain rot is certainly cruelty. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a horse that has it, you should certainly address it before, right. because it could, you know, become an issue, and I'm sure it's painful. One of the calls that we get quite often is lack of water. And I understand that a horse, we have um, two women that do our livestock investigation and they both have horses. But a horse needs seven gallons of water a day to make saliva. That I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. And um, in the winter time, a stream that's frozen is not adequate water. Right, and neither so, is snow in all right, reality. <laughs> right, right. You were, we were talking earlier about um, the horses that were tied in the woods and left. Was that the Seneca case? Yes. Tell me about that. Yes, that was... Well, it was about this time last year. Um, we got a call uh, regarding three horses that were found tied in the woods um, in Fairhaven, Vermont. Did they just happen to be found? Um, well, in all actuality, it was one of these cases where um, someone knew about them. Mm -hmm. um, one of the horses had gone down, and it got to the point where this person couldn't take it any longer. Uh, whether you know, they were friends or relatives, I'm not quite sure, but um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it was great that they called. One of the horses, unfortunately, could not be saved, had to be euthanized on the spot because it was, you know, down, had been down for a while and was starved. Um, if those people hadn't called, the other two, I know the Seneca horse, mm -hmm. um, she would have died that night. She was very emaciated, very weak. Um, so certainly if the phone call wasn't made, that horse would have been lost as well. You know, uh, it drives me crazy when I hear from people that it's suspected, I mean, or it's abuse, and they don't want to get the people in trouble. And my line to them is, if that were a child, would you remain quiet as well? And then they stop, and it's like, no, of course not. Animals are voiceless. They need us to be their, you know, advocate. So uh, it's too bad. Where are the other two horses? They're at our facility. Um, they've recovered, and Can they're available for adoption. Ah, that's yeah. great. We recently got a call from the police about a horse um, with a neglect situation, and we sent our investigator up, who um, is a vet technician. And she did a very good report that I know the police turned it over to you, and then you went in and rescued this horse. Right. Can you talk about that a little bit? This is one of those cases where um, the horse was thin and the horse had um, an injury to its hoof. Um, the folks didn't have money for vet care to provide this horse with medical care. Um, so we took the horse in um, under care, custody, and control so the horse could get immediate medical attention. Um, you know, it was one of those things where I don't think that this was at all intentional. It was financial hard times, um, and a lot of people love their animals, and it's hard for them to really to let go. Um, so we, we got medical attention for the horse, brought her to our facility, um, spent quite a bit of time uh, soaking her hoof, um, caring for her. 
<coughs> she had a, a large infestation of tapeworms. Mm -hmm. She had lice. Um, so she had a lot more things going on that would, you know, that probably contributed to her weight loss. Mm -hmm. um, but now she's doing quite well. She's on the re road to recovery, and yeah. Um, yeah. So it was another happy. Another moment. good. But you know what, Gina? People make choices. If you can make a choice to buy a pack of cigarettes for what is eight, nine, ten dollars now, don't tell me you can't buy a warmer. And with this one in particular, it's like choices. Yeah. If you commit to an animal, take care of that animal. Um, that's what I find frustrating a lot. Um, but I know that you're a five hundred one c three, means nonprofit. So the money that you take in, people who make contributions for you, it's entirely a tax write-off, so that's a good thing. But caring for horses, it has got to be enormously expensive. It is. Horses are a whole other beast. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly from dog and cats. I mean, they require much more space. They require um, different nutrition, of course, uh, hoof care, uh, parasite maintenance, um, but most importantly, it's the handling of them and the um, the training of them. And um, it, it's much different in the sense that um, you are kind of limited to the people as well. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, sometimes people think that the state of Vermont pays for horses, livestock. Oh gosh, no. <laughs> I know it. I know. No, we don't get any state or federal funding. Um, in fact, when law enforcement seizes animals, they hand them over to us, and that's it. They're, they're not responsible for any of the expenses that go into um, their care. And the laws state, of course, that we have to provide medical attention to the animals within a certain amount of hours, which we do. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's really taken on um, by us, and we get donations through just caring people that, that want to help and um, advocate for animal welfare. See, there's something wrong with this system, because if that were a child taken out of an abusive situation and placed in foster care, the foster parent does not absorb the cost. There should be no difference. These are the victims. So, it, Well, I agree, and there yeah. are many states that that have budgeted money for animal welfare. Mm -hmm. um, Vermont's not one of them, well, unfortunately. It's something we need to get on the table then. Yeah. So, when what happens to animals after they go to Spring Hill, immediately? I think you talked about it briefly. Um, <clears throat> if they're when they're taken to our facility, of course we kind of evaluate them to see what their needs are. Um, most likely, that involves a veterinarian, um, a farrier to take care of their hooves. Um, we put them on a diet, um, like if they're really emaciated, you have to be very careful. In fact, um, I hear a lot of stories about people, you know, rescuing, rescuing horses um, that they've either seen for sale or they've gotten at an auction and they'll, if they're skinny, they'll want to feed them because that's what we want to do. Right. But the horses are very sensitive, so you have to uh, do it in a manner that's not going to kill them because mm -hmm. really it can. It's a really delicate situation. They have right. a very delicate digestive system. So we put them on a feeding program that will gradually bring them up to weight uh, where they should be. You know, I, I personally think horses get the short end of the stick. I mean, some people keep them for X amount of years and then sell them, or you mentioned the auction. We wouldn't do that to our cat. We wouldn't do that to our dog. Yeah. And horses, I don't really know them real well, but personalities? They've got individual personalities just like people. Mm -hmm. um, they are cognitive animals. They think, they feel, um, they have an attachment to uh, humans, mm -hmm. other horses. They're very herd-oriented animals. Um, some horses get attached to goats. Some horses get right. attached to chickens. I mean, really? Absolutely. Wow. Um, you hear of a lot of race horses, they'll give them a companion like a goat or a chicken because they're confined a lot just to keep them company because they, uh -huh. they want to belong. They're prey animals, so a single horse in the wild is much more prone to being eaten by a bobcat 
than a, a herd of horses. That's why it's very important I didn't for know them that. to have that okay. in their lives. I didn't know that a bobcat would go after a horse. Oh, certainly. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, let's talk about Premarin horses, female horses. Tell me everything you know about that process and what it is. All right, Premarin is, or they call it the PMU industry, and it stands for pregnant mare urine. And Premarin is the name of a drug. Um, it's a hormone replacement therapy drug, uh, usually given to women during or after menopause or, or during, during menopause or after a hysterectomy. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a hormone that's derived from horses. Horse urine. Horse urine, a pregnant horse urine. In fact, if you break a pill open, mm -hmm. you can smell urine. Ooh. Yeah. I wonder how many women know that or the suffering that goes into it. I mean, tell me how they get it from the horse. Well, generally, um, a PMU mare will be tied up in a barn um, and a catheter will be, would be inserted into her u urethra where the urine would then collect into a, a bag. Um, a lot of times they're kept dehydrated so that the urine is more concentrated because they want that hormone. Um, and of course, if you need to collect urine from a pregnant mare, what do you have every year? You have, Breeding again. You have a baby. And I was going to ask if the baby's been compromised by lack of sufficient water. What happens to the... Um, we started, at when, when we started in 2000, for seven years, uh, we did PMU rescue, went to Canada actually and purchased hundreds of these foals over the years and adopted them out um, and into homes so that they wouldn't go to slaughter. Um, never did we see any kind of ramifications of the um, treatment or of the process. Right, for the foal. Right. Um, because a lot of times, you know, like with anything, like a mother will take the brunt, will give everything she can to the baby. Sure. And she'll take the brunt. And generally after eight months of collecting urine, eight or nine months, they, they will then put the mare out to pasture to breed. And when the foals are born, I mean, they really live the lives of Riley. Um, they're born out into these huge pastures with the herds. Um, they play with the other foals. They have mom. Um, but generally within two to three months, um, and the mares at that time are put back in with stallions to rebreed. So they're pregnant. Wow. Again, it can go back on the urine lines, but um, and then usually in September is when they're taken from their moms. They're shipped to slaughter sales, um, and the moms are pr back on the urine lines. Short-lived uh, life of Riley, huh? Yeah. It, it is a short-lived, but the reason I say that is because people often think that the foals are then, there's something wrong with them or the side effects, but they're really not. They're really healthy, mm -hmm. um, wonderful, wonderful horses. So um, Premarin is not, it's absolutely not a necessary drug, and I would venture to say the who wants horse urine when there are natural substitutes? Well, on the medical side of it, so um, gosh, I probably maybe seven or eight years ago, there was a national women's health study done that in, found, in fact found that this drug actually um, raised your risk quite a bit to cancer, mm -hmm. um, tumors, early onset of dementia, um, it's good blood to know. clots. I mean, and really, that did a number on the industry itself. Good. Um, when when people finally figured that out, um, mm. you know, every, I think everyone is should be allowed to make their decision, but I think that they should be given the information. Like most people don't do not know about okay. the Kremlin industry. If someone wanted to be involved in your work, what would they do? Last well, we question. have a great volunteer program. Okay. Um, we are statewide, so that doesn't mean that you have to come to Clarendon to volunteer. We have a lot of needs um, that are other than chore work. Okay. Um, in fact, we're developing community response teams now that we would like to have in place all over the state. So if 
there's a need up in the Northeast Kingdom. Uh -huh. We have a team up there that can check things out or help out with the situation that's going on. Great. Well, you know what? We'll get your contact information up. Thank you very much for coming today. All right. This well, is really great. interesting. Thanks for having me. And thank you for watching For the Animals, and please join us again next week.